<laughs> Without further business, I want to introduce our guest tonight, John Kalamikides from the Cascadia Research Center. He's a research biologist and one of the founders of Cascadia Research. Periodically, he serves as an adjunct faculty member at the Evergreen State College, teaching courses on marine mammals. His primary interests have been studying the biology of marine mammals and human impacts on this diverse group. He's authored two books on marine mammals, The Guide to Marine Mammals of Greater Puget Sound and Blue Whales. And he has just a few copies tonight for sale and he'll be happy to autograph them late, later in the evening um, for those of you that are able to purchase them. Um, he's also authored more than 50 technical reports and publications in scientific journals and has conducted studies on a variety of marine mammals in the North Pacific and conducted long-term research on blue, humpback, and gray whales. Some of the projects he's directed include estimation of the abundance of humpback whales in the entire North Pacific. That's daunting. <laughs> research on the reactions of marine mammals to air guns and mitigation efforts at mitigating the sound of air guns during, uh, during seismic surveys in Washington, British Columbia. Studies of low impact sounds from the project called ATOC, which sends low, um, low frequency sounds across the ocean to try and measure the ocean temperature. He studied harbor seal population size and impacts of human disturbance and habitat requirements at Woodard Bay in Puget Sound. And the abundance and distribution of marine mammals in the Straits of uh, San Juan de Fuca, both using aerial and vessel surveys. So he's got a wealth of experience for over 20 years in studying marine mammals. Tonight his focus will be the largest animal ever to live on Earth, the blue whale. Please join me in welcoming John Helm. I forgot an important announcement. Do you want to explain the important announcement? The technical? Oh, yes. <clears throat> uh, and so far, I, I think it's going to work fairly, pretty smoothly, but uh, we have a few transitions to both uh, play some audio and show some videotapes at different points in the talk. Uh, so there may be a few pauses to manage that, but hopefully we'll see if our little trial run goes, uh, if this goes as smoothly as our trial run, that shouldn't be too bad. So I'm going to cover a couple of different topics relating to blue whales. Uh, we actually started studying blue whales in 1986. And our, it wasn't even an intent of ours. We were doing a research project on humpback whales off California for the uh, uh, Gulf of the Farallones National Marine Sanctuary. <clears throat> and our very first day out on the water, we started to see blue whales on a regular basis. And at that time, uh, which was in the mid-1980s, uh, blue whales were still considered a fairly rare animal. In fact, some of the work that had been done on uh, blue whales uh, by authors like Greg Small that uh, had reviewed their status post-whaling were actually very pessimistic about the survival of the species. They were such a target of commercial whaling, uh, being the largest animal, uh, that many of their populations had been driven to the brink of extinction, and, and many thought potentially couldn't recover. Uh, so it was with quite a bit of excitement we started seeing blue whales off California in the 1980s and then quickly finding that there were actually far more of them than the, the humpbacks we were uh, targeting. And that's where we sort of began initially uh, doing opportunistic work, then starting to focus on ways to identify how many animals there were and their movement patterns, uh, and then trying to get insights into their underwater behavior. And that's sort of a little chronology of what I'm going to try to go through uh, tonight um, and, and explain some of what we've done over the years with blue whales. Now, we have three different uh, long-term projects we've been following at Cascadia. Uh, one is with humpback whales on the West Coast, which we also started in the mid-1980s. The other with blue whales, and the third one with what we called seasonal resident gray whales that spent time feeding through spring, summer, and fall in the Pacific Northwest. And with all of these, there are certain parallels, and often some of the field work, especially between the humpback and blue whales, overlap. And I'll actually bring in a few of our findings with humpback whales tonight, where, where it dovetails with some of the findings we're 
discovering with blue whales. And all of these involve as a central component uh, photographic identification, which I'll show you a little bit about, and with goals to determine things like abundance, movement patterns, the population structure, uh, and then looking at some of the behavior of animals. So the different components of our blue whale work, and we'll cover each of these three. Photo ID of blue whales, where we identify and track individual whales, and uh, we use that for both the movements and abundance portion of the work. The acoustic-related research, which is looking at how often they call and sex of calling animals to get an insight into uh, both how they're using those calls and how human-made sounds might have an impact on them. Uh, and then some of the uh, tagging-related work, which also relates with the acoustics as well. Now, I think most of you are familiar with photographic identification, especially with some of the species like humpbacks that uh, were some of the initial species where individual whales could be identified and tracked uh, starting in the early 1970s. And with blue whales, we're using the pigment pattern on the side of the whale. And this is a technique now that quite a few researchers have done. For example, Richard Sears with Mingan Island Cetacean Study has been tracking blue whales with photographic identification uh, since the early, since the 1970s um, uh, before we began our work. And ours started in 1986, though our catalog now uh, has many photographs in it that predate that because we were able to identify and find people who had taken photographs of them. And, you know, blue whales, which are these top two photographs on the right here, you know, have a distinctive modeling pattern on their sides and uh, we'll see a couple of different images of that, but when you blow it up and look at it, we use the modeling in the region of the dorsal fin uh, because it gives us a reference point. Blue whales are so long and their dorsal fin is fairly small and far back that you get distinctive patterns all along their body, but the dorsal fin makes it a lot easier to find where you are and match up two photographs. Uh, and this animal here that I've shown, whale 015, this is a photograph uh, of an animal that goes back to 1975 that we've seen into the last couple of years and is still reproducing. And it's the longest animal we have a track history on uh, spanning over 25 years. Now, we've also run into some very unusual animals that sort of break the pattern. There's a standard blue whale pigment. And we have had one individual with uh, a, a white, unusual white pigment on its side that we've actually been able to uh, get genetic samples for. It has some very faint modeling at it. Uh, we haven't been able to verify if it's a true albino or not, uh, but it has survived for a while. Here it is paired with a, uh, uh, a normally colored blue whale. Uh, and this animal is, uh, you know, we've tracked it through a variety of locations going back to 1997 and seen it's been seen uh, uh, by researchers in the Sea of Cortez, as well as we've seen it multiple times up off California. Now, we do most of our work in these fairly small boats, and we've slowly kind of graduated. We started with 14-foot boats, and then 16-foot. Uh, this is from about 15 years ago. I look a little younger there. Uh, and now we've moved up to the big boats down here, uh, uh, up to 18 and a half feet, and that's, that's, I think, about as big as I'm comfortable with. Uh, we really like these kind of boats because the area we're covering, and I'll show you some of the survey coverage we do, um, really requires mobility. We move up and down the West Coast, uh, operating from uh, sometimes Mexico, but most typically from Southern California up into British Columbia. And we can move these boats around. We have three of them positioned in different parts of the coast. Um, and it's very typical for us to pull them out of the water every day, every evening, move to another site because uh, you can have good weather one area. Uh, and it lets us also uh, move around the whales fairly quickly. They're fairly inexpensive to operate. So not quite as inexpensive to buy as you'd think for such a small boat. And just to kind of show you, this is taking two different years, like 2000. Ooh, I go here, it gets loud. Uh, Here's 2002, and this is the California, Oregon, Washington coast, and all these little squiggly lines are every place that we operated our boat during that year. You can see heavy effort. This is the Santa Barbara Channel right here. I'm going to turn this off. 
And I'll just talk loud and let me know if you have any trouble about this, that that was getting a little strange. Uh, Santa Barbara Channel is a major area we operate. This is an area called Monterey Bay, Gulf of the Farallones. I have to remember I'm on the East Coast, so you, San Francisco is right here. Monterey is here. Uh, Northern California, here's the Oregon, uh, California border. And we try to get out. You can see not as much coverage up north, but we have a major area up off northern Washington. That's a very productive area we do surveys in as well. And again, year to year, we try to do that same kind of routine. John? Yes? I think you need to turn your mic on. Is it recording you for the video back there? Yes. We're all set. The video mic's on. I just turned off the broadcast mic. Can everyone hear me okay? If I talk that loud, okay. <clears throat> We also do quite a bit of work going out on larger ships and taking our boat. This is a NOAA ship that was able to take our boat. More recently, we've been able to operate with uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography vessels. And that gives us a little further range to cover areas, uh, you know, a few hundred miles offshore that blue whales also use. We don't get out there as much as working the shelf edge area within about 50 miles of shore. Uh, but we're able to launch from these kind of platforms to also cover ground. Now, if you look at uh, movements, let me just see if I, oh, okay. Um, this is just, for example, uh, these triangles show all the locations we saw blue whales along the California coast uh, in 2003, last year. And then these lines connect the individuals, the same individual being seen multiple times. And you can see there's quite a bit of interchange of animals among the areas that we study blue whales along the west coast. So it's all part of a kind of an intermixing group. Uh, and every year we're likely to see uh, any of our individuals, you know, two, three, four times, uh, and then be able to get these sort of recitings. Now, one bigger question has been trying to look at broader movements of animals. <clears throat> And a project that's just starting this year that's focused on humpback whales but has already helped us to look at a little bit broader movements of blue whales has been the SPLASH project, uh, Structure of Populations, Levels of Abundance, and Status of Humpbacks. And uh, uh, it's uh, those of you who are familiar with the Yona humpback project that existed in the North Atlantic, uh, this was modeled a little bit after it. It's a little more challenging in the North Pacific because of its larger size. Uh, but it involves effort throughout the entire North Pacific by researchers, many of them already studying humpbacks, who are working in a coordinated fashion for the SPLASH project. But it also involves doing some surveys to areas that there has been little effort in the past. And uh, one of those surveys conducted by the Southwest Fisheries Science Center uh, was a fairly broad scale coverage. I think, let me see if I get the track on there. Using uh, a vessel called the MacArthur II and surveying uh, out of Seattle up through the Gulf of Alaska, uh, the Aleutian Islands. And these tracks, these were sort of the rough approximate tracks planned. They actually did something just a little different than that, but covered much of the same area. And one of the Neat things about this project is not only did it result in the identification of over a thousand humpbacks, many of them from areas that research hadn't been done, but it led to some very surprising discoveries on uh, both northern right whales, that study of the large group of northern right whales in the Bering Sea that was in the media was from this cruise. And they also cited blue whales in some areas that they had been formally hunted, but where scientists hadn't seen them for uh, decades. And so there were blue whale sightings. They had three blue whale sightings here south of Prince William Sound. Bring that down. And some of those, at least one of those animals, and we're still doing some comparisons, this dashed line here uh, matched to our collection off California. And we've also been able to do work up here in, uh, off uh, northern British Columbia and seeing that some of those same blue whales come down. Now, one thing that that's been valuable for is one of the mysteries about blue whales has been, along with the surprisingly large number of blue whales we had off California, and I'll show you our estimates in a second, one of the mysteries about blue whales had been, why were they not being seen on their former whaling grounds? 
So you had areas where they were primarily hunted and blue whales weren't being seen there anymore. And then an area off California where relatively little hunting occurred, they were being seen in much higher numbers than anyone expected. Now, was that a result of two separate populations, one that wasn't hunted so it stayed large, or had some shift occurred in blue whale uh, distribution? Now, these connections are starting to show that it's more likely that blue whales probably have gone through a bit of a shift in the areas they're spending time. Uh, and we don't, there's been a, a, a number of other studies that have found major changes occurring both in the Bering Sea and in the Gulf of Alaska that have affected a variety of other species. And blue whales may be a part of it. It could be in the past they were spending short periods of time and a small component of the population was staying off California, but most of them were continuing north and now it's most of them spend time feeding off California and only a smaller number continue north. But these connections are showing blue whales are certainly very easily capable of that kind of movement. And in fact, one of these animals, uh, an animal we saw in 97 up here off uh, the Queen Charlotte's, uh, we saw just a month later down in the Santa Barbara Channel. And not only did that sort of show the mobility of this animal moving fairly quickly, but it was going the opposite direction that we had thought blue whales would be moving because in general in spring and summer they're moving north <clears throat> up to their feeding grounds and in early summer we would have expected northward movement and this animal was actually going the reverse direction. And this is just illustrates sort of uh, uh, movements of humpbacks both in southern and northern hemispheres where in our summer months you'd have northern hemisphere humpbacks up at high latitudes on their feeding grounds. You'd have southern hemisphere humpback whales on their wintering grounds. And then in our winter, the reverse comes true and the southern hemisphere animals are feeding. And one of the interesting areas that we've been studying both humpback and blue whales, and I'll talk a little bit about, has been this area off Central America, an area that we've had some interesting findings both with blue whales and with humpbacks and looking at uh, where these animals are going to breed and in particular this area here. And that area off Central America is an area that we were very interested in to try to see where these blue whales that we're studying are going during the winter. A lot of the whaling and research that was done on blue whales during whaling days focused on the feeding grounds, which is where most of the hunting occurred. And so there didn't tend to be a lot of good information on where they went in winter and what their habits were in winter. Uh, a lot of the baleen whales, like humpback whales and gray whales, go to warm water wintering grounds where they primarily don't feed and are primarily there to breed. And often those are very coastal sites that people have been able to study and access. Blue whales clearly weren't doing that. They weren't being seen concentrated you know, in an area close to shore. One of the areas that we were interested in was this area off Central America. You can see this is the thermocline layer in winter, and it's showing this very productive area here called the Costa Rica Dome that's several hundred miles offshore of Central America. And in research that's been done these are all track lines by Southwest Fisheries Science Center, part of NOAA. And these circles show locations they had sighted blue whales. And you can see this cluster of sightings that they had in this area of the Costa Rica Dome. So this seemed like a good candidate area as a major wintering ground for some of the blue whales we studied. So in 1999, uh, with a sailboat owned by Kristen Rasmussen and Todd Chandler, we did a survey down there to the Costa Rica Dome. And it was a sort of dual survey studying both the humpbacks along the coast and going offshore to look at the blue whales that were offshore. And what we ended up finding is these show the locations of blue whale sightings. And we did find blue whales in that area we expected, and they were just a little bit offshore of that uh, area of productivity. This area is largely driven by there are a series of offshore winds that call mountain pass winds that come through this area and up through the Gulf of Tijuandepec and these help drive these upwelling areas. Now one of the 
surprising things that made it not obvious who these blue whales were in the Costa Rica Dome is that you'll see from these sightings in different months, August, September, October, November, January, February, and into March, blue whales are seen there almost year round. So that was one of the puzzles was, was that a resident group of blue whales or was this where blue whales were going to from the California feeding area in winter? And with photographic identification, we were able to very quickly see that it was in fact California blue whales that were showing up there in winter. Uh, but it still doesn't answer all the mysteries about this site. It's certainly being used as a wintering ground for the West Coast blue whales that we have. And this is a match. If you stare at this, you'll see it's the same animal. Uh, and we ended up, as we went through this, we found that of 13 animals identified in January and March, nine of them matched our California. But the animals seen in other times of year did not. So again, up here, there appears to be two components of the blue whales that are down there. And this is, uh, this is looking at four different times of year. What is the probability of the blue whales that are there being from the California population? And what this shows is that you'll see in this January to March period, it actually looks like 100% of the blue whales that are there are from California. When you get to November, you see it's coming out to about 20%. But at other times of year, you have pretty good probability. And what, this, what these probability distributions do is they take into account our sample size for that period to say how certain are you that these are blue whales from the California feeding area. And we can see we have pretty good confidence that at best only a very small proportion of those animals are represented at other times of year. And the other thing that came out of this work is looking at uh, how many blue whales were using the Costa Rica Dome. And this is an analysis Tim Gerardet at Southwest Fisheries Center did. And this is taking different months. And here we have taking that January to March period. And the estimated abundance is about 1,400 blue whales on the Costa Rica Dome at that time. And you'll see that's not too far off from our estimate that we get for the West Coast. But at other times of year, even though blue whales are being seen in summer months, the numbers are much lower, just a few hundred. So even though there are year-round sightings there, there are much smaller numbers of animals that are there. <coughs> now, this is just showing a little bit of what we know about the movements of these California blue whales. We have about 1,500 different individuals identified. Uh, and you'll see that represents about three quarters of the population. And we have some of the links to up north. These are a number of matches of whales. We have lots of matches to the, some of the studies that Richard Sears and Diane Gendron have done in the Sea of Cortez, as well as identifications off the west coast of Baja. And then here we have the nine of 14 matching the animals seen on the dome in the winter time anyway. Now, this sort of parallels, this is work that Kristen Rasmussen's been working on with humpbacks. And one of the interesting things, we have this Central America used by humpbacks that are coming from California, but also during the summertime, in this case, and there may be a parallel to what's happening with blue whales, there are humpbacks in Central America that are coming from much farther away. So this is an animal photographed in the Antarctic Peninsula and then nine months later seen off, the, uh, off of Costa Rica. And that's up at eight or nine degrees north latitude. So this is an animal that's actually traveled and crossed the equator. Uh, it represents a distance of at least 8,400 kilometers. And represents at this point, and I, uh, Greg Stone's here, he wrote a, a, a publication about humpbacks that migrated between Antarctica and, and uh, Colombia, and this stretches that uh, distance a little farther and represents the longest documented migration of a mammal. Now, I mentioned we can look at blue whale populations, and we do have estimates of blue whale numbers here, and that's just this last column right here. We've been able to estimate blue whale numbers at three different time periods off of California during the summer months when they're there feeding. And our estimates come around right around 2,000. 
And that tends to agree fairly well with some estimates that Jay Barlow and others have been trying to determine with ship surveys. Uh, and this estimate is more than people thought existed in the entire North Pacific, and we're coming up with that estimate just for the West Coast feeding area. Now, with humpback whales, we're able to actually track. This is looking at how many humpbacks are, are in this California feeding aggregation going back to the early 90s. And we were getting a very consistent, steady increase of about 8% a year in humpback numbers off California up through 1998. And then interestingly, 98 was a severe El Nino year, and we ended up with a, a major drop in numbers following that. And so uh, we, have, we don't get this kind of population tracking information with blue whales as we get it with humpbacks. Uh, so we can't really say this did or didn't occur with blue whales, but it certainly occurred with the humpbacks that we were studying in that area. Now, looking a little bit at sound and uh, kind of to go into what's been a motivation of some of our study of blue whales. Blue whales, not only being the largest animal on Earth, uh, they also produce the loudest sound. And this is, uh, we're going to listen, there are different patterns of calls for different blue whale populations. And we're going to listen to the one off California here. And we're going to hear this part here called the A-type call by scientists. And this is really low. Actually, one more track forward. I think that was a right whale. Okay, just a deep, low thumping sound. And most of the energy is at a frequency we can't hear. So we're actually more hearing some of these upper harmonics here is what we're hearing rather than the low fundamental frequency. And we can listen to maybe one more and then we'll advance. Why don't you hold on a second. We'll see. We'll hear just a second one in a, di a different recording. And again, it's a low thumping sound. Can everyone hear that? Okay. Now this one's a little harder. Let's go ahead and advance, and now we're going to listen to the B part of that call, which is just a low descending rumble. And now we're listening to this segment of the call. This is time and frequency. <laughs> I know if you guys get the cruisers with the big uh, subwoofers in the back of the car, but that's what it sounds like in our office when they drive by. But I think we'll hear one more of that. Again, it's just very low. There's another recording of it. There it is there. Actually, I, li I like what the speaker system does to it. That gives a little, a little bit more of the feeling of the animal. What's the, uh, what's the overtone? What's the higher pitch? This is actually water noise there. Okay, let's go ahead and stop it there. Actually, uh, would you, is it, let's play one more track, which is a call I'll refer to later called a D call, and it's a much shorter, irregular call. Skip one more. Yeah, one more to the next track, and we'll hear just a, another D call. Sounds like you have to back up a track. Oh, sorry. Okay, it's a low rumble. Just barely hear it there. And that's a more irregular. If we were looking at a plot of this, it would be much shorter in descending. There it is again, another short B call. Oh, now we're getting into something else. Okay. This is a, okay, so one of the interesting things about these calls is because they're so loud and they're such low frequency uh, is the distance over which they can travel. Uh, and, you know, in the North Atlantic, there have been recordings of blue whales that the Navy has tracked with its SOSIS hydrophone system where they were able to track a blue whale with a particularly distinctive call uh, over an extended period. I think they gave it a name like Old Blue uh, and I think they were tracking it out at distances of, you know, hundreds to close to a thousand kilometers. Uh, most of the recordings we're doing were getting ranges of 10, 20, 30 uh, kilometers typically on the recording of blue whales. But in deep ocean channels, 
it's possible for a call like this to be heard over very large distances, even potentially in the thousands of kilometer range. And because it's such low frequency, the other concern people have had uh, with this has been that things like the Navy's low frequency active sonar are down in these low frequencies that would risk having an effect on this. The same issues, the, the same properties of sound, which mean the lower the frequency, the less loss there is with distance, mean that when, he, when we introduce sound into the environment, when we introduce low frequency sound, it also has the potential to affect and carry much farther than say the high frequency sonar or other noise sources that there are. Uh, one of the uh, things that's been useful about the blue whale vocalization has been that because it can be so readily recorded over large distances, it's become a major tool in monitoring blue whales. Um, how long did it take to actually figure out that that noise was an animal? Right. Well, the, you know, the Navy and the Navy hydrophone technicians were the first ones to describe many of these vocalizations because in uh, using sonar detection hydrophones, they would, you know, hear and describe in some of the early publications, scientific publications, you know, attributed some of these sounds. But it's interesting. There are other, there's a particular sound, and I think there's even a recording of it on this tape called the boring which was a sound that was recorded going back over 50 years, but it wasn't until the last two years that people figured out what it was. So in some cases where a recording was able to be gotten close to the source and identified, people were able to link them. And in other cases, it remained mysterious. And in the case of the Boeing, there was speculation, was it a fish? You know, was it some type of a seismic event? It was very seasonal. It occurred in tropical waters. And people dismissed that it was a whale because they weren't seeing whales in the area they were hearing it. And it turned out to be minke whales were producing this boring sound. And minke whales, you know, for those of you who have been on the water, can be pretty hard to see. They don't have a visible blow and in poor sighting conditions. So they were probably just being missed before. So <clears throat> it's often been a complicated process of signing. Sometimes uh, people have done it right, and other times people have thought the wrong thing was producing it. So, uh, And it still remains an issue in some cases where you try to publish something, you often do have to substantiate that you can determine it was the source of the animal. We've been able to bring two tools to bear to help us because at this point we're not trying to establish our blue whales making this call, but we have a parallel problem, which is if we want to try to determine the behavioral context for the call, we have to figure out which animal, which individual is making the call. So, and we use a couple of tools for that, and it's a, I'm glad you asked the question. One tool is we can put out a series of hydrophones and have an array that let us track, you know, very precisely geographically where the animal is that's producing the call. Uh, and we can also use putting a tag right on the animal and recording the calls off the animal back, which would have this very, very high source level if you've actually got you know, recording it right off the back of the animal. And our motivation stemmed from a couple of things. The first motivation was there's been so much tracking of blue whales occurring in the last 10 years using these calls because all of these remote hydrophone systems can record these blue whale vocalizations 24 hours a day, 12 months a year. So they're getting a huge amount of data about where these calls are being heard. But unless we have some ability to know how often animals produce these calls, does it vary by season how often they produce the call? Uh, we can't really answer the question, does the absence of calls mean there are no blue whales there? Uh, is there a metric where you can translate the rate of calls being heard to some number of whales? And does that hold through the year? And we thought we could try to gather some data to help in interpretation of this you know, data that's being gathered with these remote hydrophone systems. So that was one of our motivations. The other motivation, no, it's probably what I'm saying here. The other motivation is one related to human impacts. And this has become a increasingly controversial issue, particularly with military sonars. And in the last 10, 15 years, we've gained a major appreciation of how loud and how potential risky some of these sources are. Uh, this is the, uh, the bow installation of a destroyer uh, 
uh, with a, a mid-frequency tactical sonar. And this is a man standing right here, so you can get the sense of the scope, the size of this thing. Uh, and this particular type, maybe mid-frequency sonar, is the one that's been implicated in a number of stranding events. The low-frequency active sonar that I mentioned is a lower-frequency sonar. It would be a potentially greater concern to some of the larger baleen whales. Uh, and that's the one that is looking at being expanded in use by the Navy. Uh, it's been the mid-frequency sonar that's actually been in use for much longer than LFA that has been most directly implicated in mortalities of one type of whale, beaked whales, and in particular these Cuvier's beaked whales. And there have been a number of mass stranding events, uh, multiple beaked whales coming ashore generally alive, uh, the Bahamas was an incident that got a lot of attention. Uh, one in 96 that was published in Nature that involved a, a NATO, uh, uh, and it's unclear if this was their uh, NATO LFA or the tactical sonars they had on their ship, but resulted in strandings of uh, beaked whales there. And then also there have been a couple of cases of strandings, live animals coming ashore, in this case in Baja, uh, related to uh, air gun operations that were going on in the same area. And the evidence has slowly built up now, uh, compiled by a number of researchers showing that in more and more cases, these stranding events of live animals coming ashore, beaked whales coming ashore, have very typically occurred in areas where a loud mid-frequency or low-frequency sound source is being used. So to talk a little bit about the tagging that we do, first of all, a little, just uh, just to kind of clarify that uh, there are many different ways and types of tags people use. You know, uh, tags with either uh, VHF or satellite transmitters to look at movements of animals. Uh, uh, some of the earliest tags that were time depth recorders, TDRs, to just record the dive patterns. Uh, the addition of cameras and other instruments to tags. Uh, and then, you know, some of what we've used has been a combination of these tags. And uh, becoming more popular recently of, because of this interest in acoustics has been acoustic tags, tags that are actually recording both the sound the animal is hearing to see what, it, what it's being exposed to and how it might alter its behavior, but also to monitor its vocal behavior. And some of the tags are fairly in, invasive tags, the uh, satellite transmitters that are uh, used to track whales. And this is work that's been pioneered by a number of people on the West Coast. Bruce Mate at Oregon State University uh, has deployed satellite tags into the blubber layer of blue whales and a variety of other species. And now uh, this has occurred on a number of species worldwide. And then these send out signals to satellites that can through Doppler shift, get their location of animals. And now, for a long time, there were problems with how to attach these and have them stay on. Uh, and those problems are starting to be resolved. So, you know, Bruce, for the first time, is getting tracks of even over a year uh, on a particular animal. Now, the emphasis of our work has been on these non-invasive short-term tags to look at <coughs> diving behavior, you know, underwater feeding behavior, monitor various environmental conditions, look at the vocalizations and received levels, uh, and also look at how the animals are actually moving in the water. And um, I think I've covered that. I should mention that our work with tagging does involve a large number of collaborating groups. You know, National Geographic is who provides the critter cam that we deployed. We've been working with uh, John Hildebrand at Scripps, who's very interested in acoustics. Uh, Bill Burgess at Greener Ridge is the one who developed this uh, bioacoustic probe I'll show you. We worked uh, one season with Woods Hole with their DTAG. So there are a number of groups involved in uh, this tag development. And when we do this tagging, I should mention all, a lot of this other uh, these other techniques like photo ID or biopsy skin sampling, we often do in conjunction with the tagging because that'll give us information on the sex of the animal, its history. 
uh, probably one of the more elaborate setups that we've tagged in. This is uh, a fin whale with one of the bioacoustic probes that we put on. Uh, and this is a research vessel called FLIP that Scripps maintained that's owned by the Navy. And this whole vessel, it goes out as a normal vessel towed out. And then when you get it on site, the whole front of the vessel floods with water and it pivots up on end. So the beds and the stove and the refrigerator and everything else has to be gimbaled to rotate and suddenly the, you know, the wall becomes the floor. Uh, and then you have this whole vertical platform. Our, our sighting platform up here was almost 100 feet above the water. Uh, and because of this low water, this low profile on the water, this thing hardly moved at all, incredibly stable, because you have over 200 feet submerged. Uh, it's anchored with uh, anchor lines to the side. And so we were able to both set up, uh, there was a hydrophone array to track vocalizations of animals. There were recording instruments under this, a vertical array. We had observers, and we were actually able to suspend our rigid hull inflatable and launch it because we deployed this 100 miles off, off of San Diego at Tanner Cortez Bank and in an area where we had lots of fin whales so we could track their movements visually, tag them, and then be getting all the recording information uh, from the acoustic array. So sometimes we have a lot of other things that we can help us in interpreting what we're getting from the tags. You know, the, the two basic tags that we've deployed most commonly have been the National Geographic Critter Cam, and that's a fairly large tag because the housing holds a Hi8 video camera. Uh, it does have a hydrophone in it. It does measure pre pressure. All of these tags get some basic data like dive data. <laughs> this is the bioacoustic probe that's much smaller uh, and doesn't have a camera but gets much higher quality acoustics. We deploy these right from our small boat. We basically come up alongside the whale, and uh, we'll look at a video sequence in a second here of, of the deployment, except we'll look at it from the uh, tags perspective. Uh, but basically, we pull up next to the whale, and in the case of the uh, bioacoustic probe, we just press it on. In the case of the critter cam that's much bigger, it actually has a hose and an active suction system, so you lay it on the back of the whale and hold it there and then it sucks down, and there's a release mechanism. Critter cam, we're trying to get back, usually within just two or three hours, because that's all the film that runs. The bioacoustic probe, we've gotten multi-day deployments on, and we like longer deployments. We generally don't go much longer than a couple of days. Uh, we've also been applying these. I, I mentioned fin whales. We also apply them to humpbacks, though we discovered, unlike blue whales, that with humpbacks, we needed to get a longer pole because our initial approach re <laughs> revealed that you want to be a little further away. Uh, we've gotten pretty good at attaching these. This just shows our progression from 1999, and this plots just through 2002, what percent of animals were we actually able to either make contact with or successfully uh, make contact with or actually successfully attach the tag. And now we're up to the point where about 50% of the animals that we decide, let's try to put a tag on, we're able to get one on. We've had quite a few deployments that actually this shows different years and combinations. And the bottom line is we've done this a little over 70 times. But when you really break down what are the successful long deployments, it really comes down to a, a little over 30 times that we've gotten these on different species. So the basic dive data, and you'll see a progression. This is one of our earlier deployments, 2001, of Critter Cam. And we get this dive record. This is time on this scale going through. We put it on at about 3.30 in the afternoon. This was in the Sea of Cortez, Mexico. And this is the water depth in meters going down to about 100. And this animal was diving to about 140 meters. And we have this rather crude representation of where we knew the krill layer was from depth sounders. And you'll see we've gotten a lot better at that. And the bottom of each of these dives looks like this. It's a little kind of series of sawtooth up and down motions that we, you know, researchers before us had presumed was feeding on the krill layer. 
And we've been able to look at that in a little more detail, what these animals are actually doing on these dives. And <clears throat> you can see one thing in this case here, this animal is coming below the krill layer and then coming up into it. And we're going to take, this is the dive record of a deployment we're actually going to look at a chunk of film from. So we're going to run the film from where it goes on the whale. There'll be, uh, you'll see a series of surfaces that occur, and then you'll see this dive down, and we'll follow maybe just one or two lunges into this krill layer. Uh, and again, this is one of our earliest deployments. So try to get a mental image of, in fact, I think I can even show you a blow up. This is the bottom of that dive, and we're going to be tracking the surface and then this sawtooth part here. <laughs> uh, why don't you go ahead and stop it, rewind it, try it again. We promised flawless performance here. So the, the beginning of this will actually be the uh, animal, the, the, the video from the camera while it's still on the end of the pole on our boat. And uh, not yet. Oh, you did unplug that. Yeah. We'll keep working it out. So in this case here, we actually get the, the tag on the back of the whale. And then we, so here it is. We're riding actually on the end of the pole right now. And you want to keep an eye on this area here. You'll actually see the whale appear here before we get the tag on. So usually we're tracking this whale. We accelerate right here where we see the whale. And here's the tag going on the whale. And now we're riding on the back of the whale. This tag was kind of in the middle of the back. You'll be able to see the head up here when it raises its head. Now these undulations you see are actually the animal beating its flukes. That's what's creating some of that undulation. We'll get this back, this is a little jump. We jump ahead a little bit. This is gonna be the last two surfacings in the series. One thing you'll see is when we deployed that tag, the animal kept with its surface series. And if you can see the shoreline on the right there, that's, uh, this is in, uh, off Ila San Jose in the southern Sea of Cortez. And now watch, you'll actually be able to see the blowholes open and close here on this last surfacing. Now the animal's going down. So this is that dive down that I kind of profiled. Here are these, a couple of fluke beats to dive down. So it's beating, those are fluke beats as it goes down. And the first thing we learn is that something most divers know, it's dark down there. <laughs> So we started looking at this and we said, well, you know, gee, you can't see a thing. You know, what are we going to learn from this? But now a key thing, this animal, so this animal is now at about 20, 30 meters. It's going down to about 120, 140 meters. It's on a pretty steep descent. Actually, so, so I, it's on a steep descent. And then at some point, it's going to make that turn to come up into the curl layer. And what I want you to watch for is when it makes this turn and angles up, when it's looking back up at the sky, you'll see the head silhouetted again. And there'll be a key insight that you'll see what will happen. When you see the silhouette, watch what the head does. And then also listen to what the sound, that sound is a key indicator of the speed the animal's moving. So we're hearing lots of water turbulence. So now it's probably getting close to 100 meters, uh, starting to approach this curl layer and go down through it. Now, one thing that we were able to discover, and you'll see from the lights, is that the animal largely isn't beating its flukes anymore. It's gliding down, and I'll show you how we know that. Okay, so now it's angled up, and right there. So what happened there, and the sound drops. 
So what happened there is that animal angled up. That's where we saw the sky. And as we went through this multiple times, and then you saw the head come back, it inverted into the curl layer. And as soon as the head came back, the sound dropped off. And that was the lower jaw opening, which brought the whale to a standstill. So hence the turbulence disappeared. And this animal has just taken, engulfed a large amount of krill, having come up under this krill layer. And if you think of it, it's coming up from underneath, its lower jaw is what can open and engulf. It makes sense it would invert or roll into the krill layer to get that lower jaw into the krill layer. And now you can start to hear the noises picking up a little bit again. The animal now has just, you know, closed in its throat grooves and is starting to pick up speed again for another one of these upward lunges into the krill layer. So as this noise picks up, we should see the sky, the lightness of the sky again, and again, the head become visible and angle back. So we'll watch one more lunge, and then we'll fast forward to another critter cam clip. So here it's, it's starting to get some speed again. The noise is picking up. There's the head on the left. It was hard to see, and the silence. So. And again, that's so the animals made another one of these lunges. Okay, let's fast forward, and we'll try to get this timing. Unfortunately, with this, uh, I can't quite see the screen as we fast forward, so we're just going to make a guess when we fast forward enough. Just shout. Okay. <laughs> okay, stop. Okay, so now we're an animal that's feeding in shallower water. And can you just uh, give me about three seconds of uh, rewind? Maybe four seconds of rewind. Keep rewinding, keep rewinding, keep rewinding. Okay, right there. So this is an animal feeding shallow, so uh, we're actually tracking. We're slightly on the left side of the head. And this animal here, that's the pec fin that you see over on the left side of the screen. And this animal is going to do a shallow lunge right here. You see it do a little undulation. It rolls slightly, and it'll go into a lunge right there that's just below the surface. And you can see little, little bits of krill coming by the camera. And this animal is going to go through that. Give me about a one, one or two second fast forward. And this next lunge it'll do will be right at the surface. OK, play. Okay, so it's just starting to pick up speed now again. So this animal's only feeding at about 10 or, 20, 10 or 20 meters. And in fact, this last, it's just starting to pick up speed here. This last lunge feed, you'll see it'll come up and it'll turn and roll uh, as, it, as it comes to the surface. So again, peck fin, we're on the left side. Here's the head right here. And now it's starting to turn. Now the camera weather vanes because it's got where it's the way it's placed on the suction cup allows it to turn. So the camera is always aiming in the direction of the water flow it, that it's coming from. So this animal is actually turn is banking this way, and that's why the camera's turning that way. And here's a lunge into the surface. And if you watch, you'll actually see krill on its back there, flopping around. Uh, and that's a lunge that's taken into the krill swarm. Okay, let's do another. Fast forward? Yeah, fast forward. Okay, let's play. Now, this dive record, this is an animal, this was the densest concentration of blue whales I'd ever seen. We had over 200 blue whales in an area just seven miles by about one mile wide. And now we have some lights on the critter cam that will create this orange glow. And these animals, it turned out, were diving deeper than any of the past records of blue whales had shown them to go. These guys were going down over 300 meters to a really deep krill layer. And as this animal goes into this sort of glide mode, as it gets deeper and deeper, it becomes more, as its air spaces become compressed, it becomes more and more negatively buoyant. And then it just sort of starts sinking faster and faster. And now one thing you can pay attention to is this animal starts going, this light, you can start seeing all this 
very light stuff streaming by the camera. And especially as it goes deeper, we'll see if our lights will let us show this up, you'll see the, the amount of material streaming by the camera actually picks up. The animal's going fast and it's coming by really fast. But when it goes into the lunge, you'll be able to see what those are, that those actually are krill that this animal is going through. So this animal's going much deeper, it's diving faster, it's going all the way down to 300 meters. And at that deep, we can't see any silhouette of the sky when it comes up, but we will be able to still be able to see what it's doing. And we'll see that pattern of it becoming really quiet right where it does this lunge, and we can make out what this stuff it's feeding on is. I don't know how well it shows up. Does it show up back there that there's stuff streaming by? There's the lunge right there. And now you can start to make out a little better all of this krill along its back, all of the, the dense swarm of krill this animal just lunged into. Okay, let's fast forward again. And one final clip. Okay, let's try playing there. Now let's fast forward some more. Play. Okay, fast forward again. Let's try it there. Okay. So this is another deployment now, and we're on the right side of the whale. You'll see the edge of the pec fin of this animal. And this time we're down a little bit on the side, and I want you to watch this area right here, because when this animal lunges, you can see some of the throat pleats where it's making this lunge. So here's the pec fin, there's the lunge. And I don't know if you're able to make that out or not. It was very quick, but those throat pleats distended out. And can you? Yeah, just give me like a, a two second rewind. Okay, play. Right in here. So there they are. Okay, so let's go ahead and shut that off. <coughs> so anyway, <coughs> now to me, you know, when National Geographic got this footage, they were pretty disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, you know, when you think about those beautiful underwater shots of humpbacks, you know, or, you know, a close-up of the eye of the whale, you know, that's the sort of thing that would make good TV viewing. And this was really, we're just getting these little hints of what the animal's doing, but it sort of tells this detective story that as you play with it and look at it, it really is teaching you what the animals are doing, but you're having to get it with these little insights. It's not easy to figure. Uh, but I find that pretty exciting, but, I, you know, you can see how it's, you know, it's just not that dramatic footage that you'd love to get. So remember, this was the first dive we saw right here. Now we've gotten a little more sophisticated. This is now getting into a little better hydroacoustic records of animals. And here you now see the krill layer much more clearly, and we've superimposed the dives of these animals on the actual krill layer. Uh, this is from Monterey Bay, work that Don Kroll's doing. You can also, we've also looked at, this is now, you know, plotting where the animal's moving if it's diving. Now, you know, before this, we really could see what animals were doing and feeding when they were doing at the surface, but it was really hard to guess what they were doing underwater. But in a lot of ways, what we were seeing underwater paralleled what occurred. We saw this kind of a vertical inverted lunge at the surface, which is what that first critter cam deployment, this animal was doing something like this at depth. And then we saw some of these side kind of roll motions into it. Now we've moved a little bit away from the critter cam footage, and now we're getting more of this kind of data, which is <clears throat> the bioacoustic probe has added sensors, and this is something also the Woods Hole DTAG has, that give you pitch and roll information of the tag. So you can look at what the animal's doing even if you can't see it. So, We've been using this bioacoustic probe more because it gives us that good quality. It stays on for longer, good quality acoustics. 
and we're finding we can use these sensors to see what the animal's doing. For example, in this case, the white line is the dive record of the animal doing this classic feeding dive, in this case, down to almost 300 meters on this left scale. <clears throat> this, uh, is this orange, this color here? Yeah. Orange, okay, I'm partially colorblind, so I think. This is giving us the angle of the animal this way because it, uh, the tag rides with the flow of water, so this is pitch. So this is read on this scale over here in degrees. So this animal, when it's diving down, is diving down to almost 80 degrees straight down as it goes down. It gives us our downward angle. The other thing is these little squiggles that you see in the line, those reflect fluke beats. So we can actually see the undulations visually. And what you can see is when the animal's descending, it's largely gliding down. The animal is actually negatively buoyant. And as, as the air spaces become compressed, it drops without even having to beat its flukes. And then it has to work to turn and come up. And you see that most dramatically. Let's look at the end of this dive here where it's coming to the surface. And now we have an upward angle of 80 degrees. But look at all these squiggles. You can see how hard it's having to beat its flukes to come up. So it's able to actually, as it goes deep, glides down, but has to work to come up. And <clears throat> for an air-breathing animal, that's kind of a scary prospect. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and that, that should be occurring, you know, pretty early on here for that. Uh, so the one thing you're seeing, we can see some of the, in the orange line, we can see these upward jags as the animal does these lunges. So that's what these are. And then these yellow lines are a roll, and they're showing, and we're having... It's proving complicated to interpret both of those simultaneously, but it's clear the animal also is rolling in some of these cases as well as you know, coming up into these upward inversion type angles. Now, the acoustics we've been playing with as well as interpretation. For example, this is uh, just a dive from this July, <coughs> and here you see a classic feeding dive and over here, you'll see a dive that we would normally have not necessarily interpreted as a lunge feeding dive. It looks kind of flat bottom. And let's take this dive first of all, and we'll blow that up. And now here's, that's that dive with a blown up time scale. And you'll see we get the kind of classic read of what the animal's doing in terms of angle. But now the yellow line that I've added here now, this is actually the 25 hertz sound level that we think is a good indication of water turbulence and speed. And I've had to, to keep all this plotted on the same scale. It's actually in a reverse direction. These upward parts are quiet parts, and these parts are where it's loud. And what you'll see is how this yellow line and the dive record correspond very closely. And where the animal's doing the upward, you know, accelerating into the upward movement is where it's loudest. That's where it's doing that acceleration into it. And you see these big waves. This is the pitch as it's beating its flukes, accelerating, coming into it. And then here's where it's actually opened its mouth, and you have this prolonged quiet period that goes with the top of this dive record. So you get this nice pattern that shows you, and that's what we were hearing when we were listening. You know, louder, 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 quiet right when it opens its mouth really suddenly. Extended period, and then it starts to pick up speed again. Now, the interesting thing about that is that once we started to look at the sound levels, and now you see the sound pattern here, we take that flat bottom dive, and suddenly we realize that even this flat bottom dive, which is in blue or purple or something like that, has this same profile where the animal is actually doing a lunge. It's just doing, in this case, you know, a horizontal lunge through the krill layer. And here are these sharp fluke beats as it goes into that lunge mode, even though the dive record doesn't show it. So this, this sound change, once we kind of saw this pattern, we could start to interpret some of these dive records in ways we couldn't before. Okay, so let me try to wrap this up here. So some of the things we're learning about conclusions about feeding behavior, 
you know, for one thing, some of these dive records we're getting to 300 meters were much deeper than we thought blue whales went, but we see a wide variety of depths at which they're feeding related to the krill layer. Uh, we see that they approach prey from underneath and are often inverting or rolling into it. Uh, I'll show you real quickly a diurnal pattern in diving behavior. We also were surprised to see where we attached critter cam to pairs of blue whales that we were not seeing any indications of cooperative feeding, unlike what you see with humpbacks. And that is starting to match up with the fact that these pairs of whales, as both Richard Sears and in our work, we've gotten sexes on these animals, have generally been male-female pairs. So in the case of blue whales, they're pairing up not necessarily for cooperative feeding. I'm going to... Uh... Now, just to highlight a few of the things we're learning about calling behavior, one of the things we've discovered with our tagging data is that while some of these blue whales are producing calls at a real regular basis, three of the tagged whales we've had are producing these very irregular period of calls. And that was something that when people monitored blue whale calls, the record tends to be dominated by these regular callers who are calling over and over again. It turns out these guys are fairly, inf there are not very many of these. We've only been able to kind of track and record them in about three or four cases. And most of the animals are either not vocalizing or they're in this irregular call mode. Uh, these regular callers are generally not feeding, they're traveling, they're diving for long periods, and you rarely see them in these dense feeding areas. You know, one of our best records was this was an animal, and I will point out one thing, uh, this is a remora, a sucker fish. So this idea of having suck, something sucked onto your back is actually not a foreign concept to the whale. It's actually fairly used to having things sucked on. But this was a pair of whales that we put a tag on the trailing animal. Uh, the lead animal turned out to be a pregnant female. Uh, this turned out to be the trailing male. It turned out to be producing these irregular calls. We had a long record. This is going from the afternoon of one day to the morning. And you'll see this shift from when it was traveling and these spiked dives. These are actually those sawtooth dives they are just compressed because this is a really long time record I've compressed. Feeds shallower and shallower as the krill layer comes up with evening. And then it goes into sort of a resting mode here at night and then resumes feeding and it becomes deeper with time. Now, what was interesting is when we look at these stars, this is that same dive record, these stars show where it was producing uh, one of these calls. And so uh, one of the things that came out of that is the calls, these loud A and B calls, are being produced fairly shallow at 10 to 15 meters. And that makes sense. You know, a whale's got a trade-off as it goes, you know, the deeper it tries to go, the better sound would propagate. But air spaces get smaller and smaller until it can't produce any call below a certain depth. So it's producing these calls actually not very deep. In fact, this is a plot of the depths, but I think we're... And this is a blow-up of some of those records, and you'll see it's often producing them during these kind of little shallow periods where it hangs. And even where it does a deeper dive, it'll hold at a slightly shallower, again, primarily around 15 meters to make the call before coming up. Okay, I'm going to... Oh, went too far. So just jump to conclusions here. Most blue whales are not producing the long called, long calls. It's a minority of animals producing them. These irregular callers are actually much more common than we had realized. We've also been able to get genders on sexes on these animals. And it's the males that are producing the AB calls. It looks like both sexes produce that D feeding call. But those long, loud AB calls are being produced by the males. Uh, and the other thing is we found is they're very different behavioral contexts, like those regular AB callers were traveling animals away from feeding aggregations. Uh, irregular callers, we were most, uh, and they were mostly solitary, the regular callers. The irregular callers we're mostly seeing as paired animals. Uh, and we're also seeing major seasonal differences in the calling rate. So one of the things that's one of our goals is going to prove very complicated, this use of acoustic detections 
to try to quantify how many whales there are is going to be challenging, both because you have whales producing these calls at different rates, you only have a minority of whales producing them, and they're varying by behavioral and seasonal context. So all of that, there's not going to be some little simple calibration of how to equate how many calls you hear to how many whales there are. Okay, I think I've gone on long enough and should take any questions you have at this point. Well, if we don't recover them, we get nothing. Nothing's transmitted except the VHF signal to help us locate it. So if we don't recover the camera, not only are we out about $10,000, but we get no data. Uh, they have a VHF transmitter, so when it, it's got flotation on the back, so it'll be positively buoyant when it comes off the whale, floats to the surface. This VHF beacon sends out a signal. Um, and we use a radio directional antenna to home in on it. I've lost two critter cams. I've lost two Burgess tags. So and I'm pretty lucky at that. I'm pretty happy with that. So we, we've been losing a lot. I guess that works out to about one in 10 uh, that we deploy, we lose. And that's kind of acceptable loss. Does that area heal naturally on the, on the animal? The, uh, for the suction cup, there's actually no injury. We see no sign of anything once it comes off. You know, for those implant tags that other researchers are using, that's been an area of considerable interest, and follow-up studies are real critical on that. You know, they're usually, uh, you know, like the tag Bruce uses, they put uh, a slow-releasing antibiotic on there to try to reduce chance of infection. But there have been observations on some of the animals that it looks like, you know, sometimes it does cause an infection or injury. But that's an area they've been working on. We're Again, we're not really doing that type of tag deployment, but we are participating since we know and track many of the blue whales off California. We're trying to work more closely with uh, this researcher that does use those types of tags to try to do more follow-up and see the animals after the tag is on to kind of verify that, because that has been a concern. I think people have been satisfied it's clearly not killing the animal, but exactly how that looks. And I know with a number of uh, these tags, they've been able to get some follow-up photos with sort of, you know, Sometimes it's healing well, other times there being uh, an abscess there from where the tag was. When those whales are, are, are in that dive, that, you know, going all the straight down, how fast are they going about? Yeah, it's still, you know, it sounds really fast, but we're still not talking real fast. I mean, we're talking on the order of, you know, three, you know, three knots kind of speed, three, four knots. So what's that? You know, so that's, we're talking four miles an hour kind of thing, three, four miles an hour. Yeah, it feels a lot faster, you know, and, and it does during those peak portions go a little bit higher than that, but you're still not, you know, the animal still. Yeah, I, I was thinking more of the, in the 20s and 30s yeah. miles per hour. Right now, 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 blue whales are capable, maximum speed I've seen a blue whale be able to do is, you know, they, and it's mostly in the context of this uh, kind of social interaction, what, you know, when, when you get multiple animals uh, we call it racing behavior, but it's like a surface active humpback group where they're competing for a female. They will get up the speeds of, you know, 15 miles an hour. But that's, even at that speed, you can see all the hydrodynamics of blue whales break down. You know, there's kind of water flying everywhere. And they're, they're not, you know, they're built to kind of keep going and going and going, but they're not speedsters, not like a killer whale or some of the delphinids. Now, Mason. The energetics of going to 300 meters for a feeding dive are very different than the energetics of going to 100 meters on a feeding dive. When you examine the, those, those tracks, the animals spend more time at depth, more time in the prey patch. Do they lunge more often if they're going that deep, or do you not see dramatic differences in the energy? Yeah, no, you know, they're lunging a very similar number of times, shallow and deep. But when they're going deep, their dive durations are much longer. You're, that's where you start, you know, a humpback feeding, a blue whale feeding shallow will be more in a five minute total dive. One feeding real deep can be 12, 13, 14 minutes. And proportionally, is that more time in the patch even though the lunges are the same? Yes. Or is, is the time just for the descent and the ascent? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the ascent and descent go, still go pretty fast. You know, 300 meters sounds deep, but you know, that, that's really, when you think about it, it's only you know, about 10 or 11, 12 blue whale body lengths. You know, so the size of these animals is so immense that, 
you know, you think of something really deep and then you realize how big it is. And then you kind of realize, well, yeah, I guess it's for an animal that big, it's not that far. Uh, so you see certain trade-offs that are occurring with, with that. But a lot of it seems to be, you know, and uh, Don Kroll's done some analysis of, you know, what should be the diving capabilities. And he was coming up with, and he wrote a paper on this, that blue whales seem to dive much shorter than they should be capable of for their size. But the interesting thing is he was basing that on these dive records where he was only seeing animals diving to one, 200 meters. And the animals we're seeing, you know, feeding at 300 meters are doing these much longer dives than what he did that analysis that sort of told him something seemed to miss. You know, they should be able to dive longer. And in fact, they are. Let's take two more questions and then okay. move to the lobby. What's the latest data on the blue whale populations? Right, total, you know, it's, and I'm really glad you asked that because on the one hand, we have this really optimistic story off California with larger populations. Though, you know, some of the, the larger populations I feel we need to consider now that that California population really represents the population that was in those former whaling grounds in the Gulf of Alaska and Aleutians. It isn't as kind of dramatically high as we thought it was because it seems like the blue whales have concentrated in that area. Uh, but still, it's an optimistic, you know, it's very positive how many there are there. In the Antarctic, it's been sort of a case of where there used to be 300,000 blue whales. At the end of commercial whaling in the mid-1960s, that was estimated to have been reduced down to 10,000. But then when the uh, Antarctic surveys were being conducted, the estimates were coming up at under 1,000 blue whales for the Antarctic, that even that 10,000 was optimistic. So that looked extremely you know, bad for blue whales, that their populations would have gone from 300,000 now to potentially 1,000. Fortunately, the most recent years have suggested a bit of an upward trend, and now are coming out Antarctic populations in the two, 3,000 neighborhoods, still you know, 1% of what they were. And that's where the majority of the blue, whale, blue whales of the world were, were in that population. So kind of worldwide population is driven by that. The number that, there are a lot of blue whale populations, people don't know what the numbers are, but the number generally used uh, has been around 10,000, 10, 11, 12,000 for a worldwide current population. But it's, you know, just guesses in some cases of what population is doing. But that's probably right, you know, within some kind of ballpark. And again, compared to historical population of a, in excess of 300,000 prior to modern commercial whaling. Okay, one more question right here. John, I thought yes. the old law said that you didn't find blue whales in equatorial zones because they had so much blubber and they couldn't keep cool. So how do you think these guys are keeping cool in places like Sri Lanka? And yeah, well, I, well, you know, and I, I, I forgot to make this point. It's a real central point, actually, to what I wanted to make about the blue whales we were seeing on the Costa Rica Dome is... <clears throat> I mean, not only are they able to go there, but what they're doing very differently than humpback and gray whales is it's clear they're going there to feed. We saw feces, we saw prey, we saw animals diving down to prey. We haven't been able to put tags on animals there to really look at their behavior. But one thing that looks different about blue whales is that on their breeding grounds, quote unquote, they are going to productive feeding grounds and they are feeding through the winter. And so their movements, they're, they're more dispersed and they're moving, but they're still trying to find productive feeding grounds. So, um, you know, not only are they able to deal with those warmer waters, but, you know, they also are feeding there, which is something that, you know, whalers didn't expect. They're clearly not, you know, the whaling data that suggested that was that, you know, when you looked at the blubber layer on Antarctic blue whales, you know, it was fairly thin in the spring and then it got fatter and fatter. And then from fall to spring, it got thin again, and that suggested fasting, which a lot of the baleen whales do. But clearly, blue whales, you know, are still needing to feed, you know. And part of that's maintaining that sort of a large body size. Blue whales, when they give birth to a calf, they nurse and wean it in a six-month period. And at the end of that six-month period, that female has visible vertebrae. It gets very thin. I mean, you can see clearly they're doing everything possible to, to feed. And uh, I didn't see what Don, Don Crow recently told me that in his, some of his energetic calculations, he feels like blue whales are on the edge, you know, so they have to kind of do everything possible because to support that sort of size is not easy to do. 
John, thank you very much. Um, John, we'll stay for some more personal questions. He does have books he can sign if you'd like to purchase one uh, at the front table. Um, I hope that you will come back again next Monday evening for the Urban Whale, the uh, North Atlantic Right Whale, and then again on December 13th. Um, again, if you parked in the garage, please go get your ticket validated, and please uh, stay around, talk with one another, ask more questions in the lobby. There should be some refreshments out there. Thank you all very much for coming.